and welcome to a very special episode of Sales Ops Demystified. Welcome Heather Bruder to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Tom. My pleasure. Now, Heather actually knows one of our first guests that we had on the show, Jeff Sullen, I believe from your time at Marketo. Yeah, that's right. Jeff was my VP uh, while I worked at Marketo and just, you know, fantastic guy. Interesting. Um, and, but yeah, like he, he came on and he was like one of the, probably the first like really, really impressive person we had on the show. Um, obviously now after you, Heather. Um, <laughs> and so Heather has like significant experience in the sales of space. Um, I understand now you're in between roles. Is that yeah, correct? That's right. Okay, cool. So let's dive deep into this previous experience um, and start off with understanding how you first got into sales operations. Sure, sure. I mean, that's a great question because I think everyone has a different path into sales operations and coming out of college, it, it was nowhere on my radar. Um, you know, I was a pre-med major and even went to medical school for my first year before realizing that that wasn't the right path for me. Um, so sales operations was truly something that I came back and fell into. Uh, but it was a fantastic opportunity, especially for someone without a business background, to learn about you know what it takes to make a, a company successful and run it. So you 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 studied something nothing to do with sales ops. That's right. right. <laughs> Did That's I get that? right. So then, no, education isn't the key. <laughs> <laughs> and then when can you remember your first like exposure to something that it might not have actually been called sales ops at the time, right? It could have been called just being in a small business or but how, how, how did you first get exposed to sales operations yeah so I came into a technical recruiting company and I was the branch administrator so that was kind of the name for it under the national um, operations organization for Ronstad and mm -hmm. by coming in there you know it was learning how to run all of you know the outside portion of the um, office as far as just front desk admin but then you also had the back end portion, which is kind of the beginning of HR operations. And so that part of it was fantastic to me. And I was also reporting numbers into uh, the US organization for Ronstad. So all of that kind of accountability and that um, you know, requirement to really understand the impact of your work um, on a data and administrative basis, that's really where it started for me. Got it. And from then you progressed through to working at a number of different companies up yeah. to where we are today, is that right? That's right, yeah, and then I kind which, of moved, oh, yeah, into the tech space right there, so. Yeah, which was your favorite? My favorite, it's so tough, it's so tough to count on a favorite there. Um, you know, I really found the first place that I worked, um, AirWatch, that was truly in the technical and the software space to be the most exciting. I mean, that was that was almost like getting an MBA just through trial by fire. Um, but because of the challenges of, you know, being a startup that was based not out of California, but out of here in Atlanta, you know, it really is the bootstrapping um, mentality that, that I fell into. And I really fell in love with that kind of startup hustle. Got it. And which role did you think you've learned the most? I think my most recent role was probably what I learned, um, you know, the most technically. That was where I was uh, managing the Salesforce instance for a software company, but also some of the tech stack that plugged into it. So it got me involved with teams that I never worked with before. Um, I started working within our support teams, our customer success, um, the sales development teams, as well as sales. So. Cool. So if we focus on this latest role for the next few questions, um, what was the tech stack at that time? Yeah, uh, at Air, or I'm sorry, at Rainmaker, uh, we were on uh, Salesforce as kind of the baseline. So that really was the uh, system of truth, the CRM, and where we really were maintaining our data um, pieces. From there, we worked uh, with an outreach tool. We actually worked with Sales Loft. Uh, yep. So our SDR has worked uh, our cadences through there and also a HubSpot plugging in as well for the marketing and marketing automation teams. Uh, and then we also uh, were working with um, a supplemental case uh, system for the service cloud side for our customer support system. So, or for our teams there, uh, and we're using, a, I think it's called email to case premium. Got it. Um, and any other tools around those core ones that you're using or is that pretty much it? 
Yeah, a lot of, um, you know, sales tools. So LinkedIn Sales Navigator, and then we do data enhancements. Um, the, the most recent company I was working for is very niche. And so uh, most of your enterprise data didn't really cover the supplementing of it. So we used uh, a system called STR, and they really yeah. focus on the hotel industry and uh, those relationships there. Got it. And the size of the sales off team and the sales team that you were working with there, just roughly what was the ratio between reps and people in ops? Yeah, so uh, most recently, it was probably the most even organization. We had a very small sales team, so uh, probably eight to 10 total, including SDRs and sales, uh, as well as, um, well, yeah, th that would make up our core. And then about three sales operations people. So someone uh, handling the data and administrative tasks, someone uh, more on the technical side and maintaining of the systems, and then a director. But Interesting. I so that, that violates the ratio that I've been Yeah. It has never been that way. And in, in every other organization, it's been, you know, that one to 20 kind of uh, a stretch mm -hmm. out and really trying to grow to meet. As you grow a sales team, you're trying to also in step grow your uh, sales operations. So did, did this mean that all of the salespeople there felt like they were very, it was almost luxurious to be a sales <laughs> rep, a, a rate maker group? I would hope so. But, you know, really, uh, the hope is that everyone feels that way, no matter what sales team's uh, size you're looking at, because if you can really scale the process out um, and really have those considerations in mind, you're really trying to make it, you know, the limousine for everyone. Got it. Um, you, I think you mentioned, I'm not sure if this was the last role or one of the previous ones about being responsible for Salesforce and its data. Um, in that, like, it, it, at the Rainmaker Group, it is Rainmaker Group, right? That's right. Um, were you, with the, your three sales ops resources, responsible for keeping the data accurate in Salesforce? As far as the, uh, you know, the correction of data and actual manipulation on the accounts, yeah, they were, that was uh, truly on the sales operations side. Um, you know, we really relied on our sales development teams and our sales uh, and our customer success teams to keep us abreast of what's happening in the industry. Uh, mm -hmm. For ours specifically, you know, it's a it's a company uh, structure that uh, can be purchased on many levels. And so the structure is always changing. And, and that was probably one of our biggest challenges was to make sure that the data stayed intact. Uh, because yeah. when management companies sell different assets, you know, you're it's impossible. There's no press release. You're not getting that information. So that was kind of the duties that fell outside of sales operations was, you know, alert us to let us know what's happening. Um, but really the, the you know, maintenance and, and the automation was set up through us. Got it. Um, getting buy-in from the sales team, if you're trying to enable or getting them to adopt a new tool or process, what things worked to actually get them to do a thing? That, um, I think it starts everywhere from, you know, where you're coming up with the solution from and, and what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, you know, I think sometimes you're being reactive and, and that's completely fine because problems come up and, and we need to address them then. Um, and then there's also the proactive step. And that's really the side that takes you uh, into understanding, you know, how to sell yourself, how to understand um, how to really, you know, build out what the value is for doing something that's really not an issue yet uh, and trying to get ahead. So I think, um, you know, first having that baseline relationship between sales and sales operations is huge uh, because if you, as a sales leader, trust that the operations person is bringing something up, not, not for a frivolous reason, but because they can seriously see an issue and are trying to get ahead of it, that trust bypasses all of that having to sell. And, uh, Interesting. So you're saying that if the sales off team is super proactive about potential issues and then you go to whoever in the sales team and say, I think this could happen and the impact on our pipeline is going to be X, he immediately, like he believes you have his best interests at heart and therefore would trust you. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I think. Got it. Um, quick question. Do you have experience in sales yourself? No, no, I've never sold. Has that ever been a challenge with trying to build the buy and all relationships with sales teams or, or not? I mean, I think it's because I've always worked, you know, in step with them in, in every position. Um, I've always been really that, um, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm the partner. I'm, I'm riding along. I'm, you know, there because the best interest is for you to have an easier time selling, for me to have better numbers to report. You know, the, there's a very in-step relationship that I think goes along with it where you don't have to have sold to empathize for the position of a different salesperson. Um, and I think even if you do come from sales, you know, you're also dealing with uh, customer success, account management, sales development, other teams that didn't have your same objectives. So I think empathy above all really helps you succeed in this role. Got it. Um, this might be a super like novice question, but the big like revenue or let's say you have a sales manager is responsible for like 10 SDRs and four A's. Um, the sales manager is responsible for the, the quota for those, all of those A's and SDRs, right? Yeah. And then let's say the sales manager works with one sales operations resource who is responsible for making the whole thing work. Maybe it wouldn't be like that because if you had 10 teams, you'd have a central sales op team, but would then the sales op, like the metric for the sales ops person, is that also revenue or does the sales ops, is the sales ops person judged by different metrics? That's a good uh, question. So are you asking, um, you know, should should a sales ops person's performance be measured on those uh, same numbers? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or do they have different metrics? I think there's definitely different metrics um, that, that come into it because I've supported uh, sales teams of all size uh, from SMB all the way to enterprise. And, and the needs are so very different, but, you know, you're really juggling with an SMB company. You're, you're talking volume of deals, even though everyone isn't, um, you know, incredibly high volume or high um, value. It, it's still a lot of them happening. So you have your challenges there. Uh, and then on the enterprise side, you know, you're really tracking engagement and activity on sales and a lot of other factors over a longer time. So it's tough to say, you know, there's a dollar for dollar value, but it is really important to come up with metrics that are important internally to a sales operations team to understand your performance. And I think that you should be, uh, you know, eating your own dog food. You should be, you know, doing the same metrics, have a dashboard for your sales operations team, nice. understand and get your requests into cases so that you can start mm -hmm. tracking those and understand what kind of issues you're dealing with. Yeah. So if I'm the CEO of a business and I'm trying to, or like the COO, let's say, and I'm trying to understand how my sales ops team is performing, you're saying that there should also be dashboards and metrics that they're accountable to, that, that probably would be different. Definitely, to, definitely. To awesome, thanks for that education, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. I'm presuming you've onboarded a few salespeople in your time uh, in this industry. Do you have any best practices you can share? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, I've, I've worked with teams that are remote and I've worked at, with teams that are in person. Um, so a lot of things has to do with, you know, um, really curating your content for your audience where you're going to meet them. Um, understand if you have someone in person to onboard, you know, you can have a very different type of program that's very intense over a short period of time, as opposed to dealing with a remote uh, employee where you really need to make something that's, uh, you know, links that are accessible at the times that they need them, uh, reviewable uh, kind of content that is there when you're not there. Um, so I think that, you know, personalizing across a couple different factors are really important in onboarding. So thinking about, you know, size and location of your team, um, how complex is your sales process and overall, how complex is your product? You know, if this is something that someone needs to learn continuously and, you know, needs to invest time in that, then enablement and training should also be involved in this onboarding for sales. Nice. Um, and then making reps more productive. What, what, what have you done previously that has had a good impact on the amount of activity or results that sales reps can produce? I think really meeting people where they are. You know, um, a lot of times uh, we get really distracted by a very, very tech stack. And so uh, mm -hmm. really picking a place that you're going to say this is going to be our source of, you know, truth, our source of information, our source of activity, mm -hmm. that's a really huge piece because no one wants to be logging into, you know, a bunch of different places just to capture that they've done work uh, or do more work just to show that. So, um, you know, trying to come in and, and look at it almost from like a marketing standpoint and saying, where is my audience? Where are they already? And what can I do to not, um, you know, bring more work into your day that isn't really valuable to you? 
And mm -hmm. then on the other side of it is if you can't do that, if there's a step that you need to take that another team within the organization needs you know, data put in, they need information, uh, really try and make that one step as multifocal as possible. Go out there and say, okay, you know, marketing team, you need this information in this contact tag tier. What other teams could possibly use this information and which other ones could, could benefit from using this? So making more value out of that one step is my, my kind of consolation prize. Nice. So if you have to do something to tweak the process, try and find other people that can, that would use the, the thing you're doing. Yeah. Cool. Now let's talk about KPIs. Um, so we're talking about KPIs now for the actual sales reps. If you had one KPI, if you, if you can only measure the performance of your reps with a single KPI, um, what would you choose and why? Ah, there's so many. <laughs> um, I think right now I'm getting a lot of focus on um, opportunity ages and 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 interesting. I haven't had this before. It's it ties into a lot of things, but if you have a, an opportunity management process that allows opportunities to last for a long time and you don't quite have a, a standardized sales process, you have a very long engagement. Um, for me, I'm starting to see, you know, just looking at that one factor and saying how long has this opportunity been open. Um, even if you don't have those other factors yet and you just have to dig in and find it, I think that that tells you a lot about, you know, how long has this pushed, um, you know, how many contacts and, and people do we have engaged in this opportunity, what different channels are we hitting on. Um, so right now I'm a little focused on that, but it can change. Interesting, because you would know the average or you, like, you know the average close time, and so you're saying that's one metric that can give you quite a lot of information. And prioritize things you need to do? Well, mostly on a rep level, looking at the the opportunity age for things that are in your pipeline. So really parsing out stale deals and, and cleaning out distraction, I think is something that has become a big focus for what I'd like to do, what I like to see. Um, yeah. Because I think that it gets to be, um, you know, when you've got a big, uh, when you got a sales force that you know, turns over or changes territories, it's very easy to get this backlog of, opportunity pipeline that you know hides in a long sales cycle um, and so being able to really look into those and then you know now getting into more of like the sales velocity side is is where I'd start to look not not really your average um, age of of your deals but specifically on a rep what they're holding in their pipeline and, and how long got it um, I quickly want to talk about sales forecasting um, at the, the last role, we had the three people in ops and eight people in sales. Who, like, were you responsible for forecasting sales or was the sales manager responsible for that or did you work together? And then how did you, did you meet every week to understand the forecast? Like, how did you, how did that work? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of it um, has been parsed out into the sales managers are responsible for reporting the number and then digging into information and coming up with the reports and the template and the format is, is to the sales operations side. So I kind of think that the structure really should fall to the operations team, um, but the cadence, the content, um, you know, how much we want to dig in on each meeting, that should always be, and, and what numbers are ultimately rolling up, I think that should always fall to leadership and ultimately to the sales team. Um, because then you kind of own, you know, this is me giving you the format to see the information as you need it, uh, but really managing the data and managing the truth and, and what's happening in these deals, I, I will always, you know, I give that. No, yeah, I give that up because that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> Got it. Interesting. So the sales manager is then responsible for the, the forecast, but he's able to get to that number effectively and accurately with the work from the sales operations team. Yeah, and I think that, you know, they're, they're definitely a person at the table. They're there in those meetings to, to call truth to anything or to see, you know, live issues that can be solved quickly. If there's just, you know, a quantity that's off, if there's a date that's off, if something is sitting on the wrong account, uh, those kind of things, if you can knock them out in seconds as opposed to asking someone to do it and waiting for them to, you know, get it corrected, that's that's quick, um, you know, quick data manipulation right there. Got it. Um, and final question: Who, and we can't say Jeff for this one, I'm afraid. Um, who's taught you the most in sales operations? Uh, let's see. Um, Jeff would have been so easy. <laughs> 
So uh, I really do credit one of the first sales leaders I worked with as as really giving me an, an insight into why data is important and why uh, numbers are important. So I worked with um, a sales leader, Kevin Kiley, and he was at the time the uh, executive director of our enterprise sales at Airwatch. And, um, you know, there was a lot of that trust there, but also a lot of that, like I said, the delineation of responsibility, um, you know, to, for me, it was running meetings and running the forecast and making sure that those were represented correctly. And then the real life of it was, you know, someone else was kind of getting that, that stuff done. Um, and so kind of having that um, trust and then also having that um, ownership over my realm showed me how, you know, sales and sales uh, operations should work together. So I think that that was really one of the first areas where I started kicking into it and saying, okay, this is why this is important. Got it. Um, okay, and there we go. Um, I have just a few things I picked out that I really wanted to recover cover over again. Um, yeah. The point you made about getting buy-in is before even answering the question, you said that actually it more like it matters more where you got the solution from and if you got that from the right place and if you're truly partnering with the sales leader or sales team, then they're going to be bought into the process anyway. Um, the part about understanding the forecasting, how operations kind of provides the structure and the data for the sales manager to be responsible for the forecast with an insight that we hadn't had before. And then having almost like marketing to the reps, uh, you're, you're trying to get them, you're trying to, if they're here in this place in marketing, you would go and advertise there and you wouldn't try and take them off Facebook or whatever. Um, yeah. And so the same with the reps to make them more productive and try and understand where they are and then bring what they need to them so they can just do their thing and have to think less about process and more about closing the deals. So immensely valuable 20 minutes. Heather, thank you so much for your time and for coming on. Um, and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Yeah, great, great meeting you and uh, thanks for your time.